Welcome, this is Dr. G, and in this video, I will be covering two very important concepts that you should know if you're taking or if you're planning to take general science courses such as chemistry, physics, or biology. The two concepts are significant figures and scientific notation. I'll be straight up with you, these two concepts are not very interesting. They're more annoying than anything else. But unfortunately, if you want to do well in the science courses that you're taking, you have to be familiar with these two concepts. There's no way you can do well if you struggle with sig figs or scientific notation. From personal experience, I've worked with students who lost more marks due to sig figs than to the actual concepts of chemistry or physics in their courses, which is tragic, right? Luckily for you, because you're watching this video, it's not going to happen to you. <laughs> In this video, I will first start with significant figures before moving on to scientific notation. You got this. And remember, have some fun. Let's go. When it comes to significant figures or sig figs, you're gonna come across a lot of different ways to memorize it. While I don't find anything wrong with that per se, I do see two potential problems arising from that. The first one is when you're stressed in a test taking situation, you're gonna have so many other things memorized for the actual topic like chemistry or physics that you might make mistakes on the sig fig portion, which will cost you marks. Secondly, as you're preoccupied with the memorization and the rounding and the decimal moving, you miss out on the only interesting part of sig figs, which is why we use it. Sig figs actually expresses the level of confidence you have in a number. So I'm going to show you how to deal with sig figs with three rules, except I'm going to correlate these rules with scenarios in which you can understand why we use these rules. So in the first scenario, let's pretend there's four contestants that have to guess the weight of this elephant on the screen. These four contestants cannot talk to each other, and only one of these four contestants actually know the weight of this elephant. So here are their answers for contestant A, B, C, and D. Now, if you were to pick, which contestant do you think has the most confidence in their answer for the weight of the elephant, and therefore most likely be the contestant that actually know the weight of the elephant? It would be contestant D, wouldn't it? How come? Well, let's take a look at contestant A and B. They guessed 5,000 and 6,000, but do you really think they mean exactly 5,000 on the dot or exactly 6,000? Probably not. The reason is these zeros in the 5,000 and 6,000, they don't reflect any type of confidence, do they? It just gives the impression that the number is an estimate with almost no confidence. Whereas in contestant D's answer, 3,122. Ask yourself, why so specific? Why are you giving me 3,122? Are you so sure it's not 3,123? So because contestant D is so specific in his answers with these non-zero digits, that's what shows that contestant D has the most confidence in his answers. Which brings us to the first rule of significant figures. All non-zero digits are significant figures. Pretty simple, right? That means any digit from one to nine are automatically significant. That also means that rules two and three must deal with the annoying zero. To fully understand rule two, let's pretend there is a similar game with just a different sized elephant. This time there's only two contestants, one of whom knows the actual weight of the elephant. Contestant E guesses 5,000 kilograms, whereas contestant F guesses 4,009 kilograms. Huh, 4,009 kilograms. Didn't we say earlier that all digits from 1 to 9 are significant? That means that 9 at the very end, that's significant and it represents confidence. So because contestant F is confident with his last digit of 9 and the first digit of 4, it would make sense that contestant F would be confident in the numbers in between. Which means the zeros in between the 4 and 9 are automatically significant with confidence. So that brings us to rule number 2 zeros that are between significant figures will automatically be significant. In the next scenario, pretend you're going to weigh yourself by stepping on two different scales. The first scale reads 150 pounds, whereas the second scale reads 150.00 pounds. 
Now, they both really represent the same number here, but which one gives you more confidence that you actually weigh exactly 150 pounds? It would be the scale on the right. How come? Well, notice the scale on the right has a decimal with two zeros at the end, but we know, mathematically speaking, those two zeros at the end don't really contribute anything to the number. But notice on the left scale, without the decimal and the two zeros, do you feel as confident that you're at 150 on the dot? Or could you be 150.1 or 150.01, right? Whereas the right scale, even those, those two zeros at the end of the decimal, they're redundant. But by having it there, it's almost like the scale is showing off and saying, hey, I am super precise. I can be confident you're exactly 150.00 pounds. So in a sense, because the right scale shows the zeros that don't even have to be included, but it chose to include it, that actually gives us more confidence. The third and final rule of sig fig states, zeros that had to be written are actually not significant. So example would be the number 5,000 or something like 0 0.05. In both of these cases, you had to write those zeros if you wanted to show the numbers. Could you have given me 5,000 by just writing the five? You can't, because that just means five. Or could you have given me 0 0.05 without the zeros and just the five? You can't. Remember, we naturally don't trust the zeros. We don't get any confidence from zeros. So any zero that was there because it had to be there, we don't count them. They're not significant. On the other hand, zeros that did not have to be written, but were still written, those zeros are significant. For example, what about 7.00, right? Did we have to include those zeros to show that the number is seven? No, we didn't. Those zeros didn't change anything, but we still included it. Why? To show our confidence in the precision of that number. So anytime you see zeros, that makes you wonder, why were those zeros written? They're pretty pointless. Well, those are actually there to show precision and confidence, and they are significant. Rule well, one and two really isn't that bad, but it's rule three that requires the bulk of your attention. So always keep in mind when you see zeros, always ask yourself, did the zero had to be there? Or is it there just to prove a point that they have extra confidence? Using the rules that we know, let's see if we can figure out how many sig figs each of these numbers have. Starting with 13, just using rule one here, both digits are significant. We have two sig figs. Question number two, we see the zero in the middle, but there's sig figs in the front and the back. So that means using rule two, there's gotta be four sig figs. The number 40, the four is significant, but what about that zero? Well, that zero had to be there to give you a number 40. So it's not trying to show any sign of confidence. So we don't count that zero, only one sig fig. The next number here, we have a one in the front, one in the back, rule two, all inclusive, six sig figs. 0 0.5, the zero in the front that had to be there to show the 0 0.5, otherwise it will be just a five. Uh, so that means only the five counts, just one sig fig. Same thing with 0 0.005, those front zeros all had to be there to show the number 0 0.005, only one sig fig, which is the five. Continuing on, 15,000, those three zeros at the end, they had to be there to give you the 15,000, so we don't count them, only two sig figs, which is the one and the five. 0 0.04000, now those three zeros after the four, did they have to be there? Not really, because it's 0 0.4 either way, so because it didn't have to be there, but still there, that means they're there to prove confidence, and we like that, we count those, so that's four sig figs. Uh, 378.0, again, the point zero seems pretty redundant, but it's there, that means it's gotta be there for a reason, we count that four sig figs. Next one here, 0 0.03050000. Which zeros count? Well, the ones between the three and the five that counts as per rule two. These ones also count as per rule three. The front ones don't count, they never do. So then we actually have a total of six sig figs. The negative doesn't make a difference at all in sig figs. So negative 100 is still gonna be one sig fig, which is just a one. And then finally, 10,000, but this time do you see a decimal at the end here? That decimal is a bit weird. It counts as significant, but it's not a significant figure on its own. So that means the one in the front is significant and it's a significant figure. The decimal is significant, which traps all the zeros in the middle as per rule two, but the decimal itself doesn't count as a sig fig. So we have actually just five sig figs, which is the one and the four zeros. So if there's a decimal at the end of the number, that decimal is significant, but not a sig fig, 
meaning it'll help you with rule two if there isn't zeros in the middle, but it won't count towards your actual sig fig count. That rule only applies to decimals at the end. It doesn't apply to any other decimal like the one you see here with a 0.4. That doesn't count. It only applies to a decimal at the very end of a number. So this is a number written in scientific notation. We're going to cover this in just a few minutes. But for now, let's see how sig fig applies to scientific notation. When it comes to scientific notation, there's always going to be a times 10 to the power of something. Well, we never even look at that ever for sig figs. Never look at that part. For the sig figs, we only look at the number in front of the multiplication. And here we see 5.00. So we'll just do what we normally do for sig figs here. And this should be three sig figs. Now that we know how to calculate sig figs, how do we use it in calculation questions? When we add or subtract, actually, we don't look at sig figs ever. We just keep the lowest or the least decimal place out of all the numbers we're adding or subtracting. For example, if we did 21.25 minus 1.7, the answer would be 19.55. But hold on a second. How many decimal places does 21.25 have? Two. What about 1.7? One which means our final answer should have the least decimal place, which is one. So we have to round it to 19.6. When we multiply or divide, which is gonna be way more common than adding or subtracting when you do physics or chemistry, we always keep the lowest sig figs out of the numbers that we're multiplying or dividing. For example, if we have 21.45 times 1.70, that's gonna give us an answer of 36.465. The 21.45 has four sig figs, the 1.70, has three sig figs, which means we have to round our answer to three sig figs. And if we were to do that, our answer should be 36.5. The easiest way to use sig figs properly when you're answering questions throughout chemistry or physics is to always scan the question for the numbers they give you. In this case, they gave us two numbers here. Find the number with the lowest sig figs. In this case, it will be my 1.7 times 10 to the power of negative six because it has two sig figs. Once you know that the lowest sig fix is two, you can do whatever you want throughout the question. You can keep as many decimals as you would like to keep your numbers precise. At the very end though, when you're submitting your answer, just round your answer to two sig fix. When you're doing multi-part questions, always leave your answers for each part with a proper sig fix. But if you need to use the answer of one part to do the next part, don't use that rounded answer. Use the pre-rounded answer, so make sure you don't erase it in your work. For example, in this question, they give us two numbers, both of which have two sig figs. Okay, so that means in part A, I have to keep my answer as two sig figs. As you can see, we got 44.1, but we rounded it to 44 newtons to respect the two sig figs. But we need to use that number in part B, so which one do we use? Yeah, we use the 44.1. And then when we do that, we get an answer of negative 2.94, but because of the two sig figs we're keeping, we round it to negative 2.9. Look at part C. We have to use that number again. Are we gonna use a negative 2.9? Or should we use the negative 2.94? We're gonna use the negative 2.94. All right, let's now talk about scientific notation. On the screen, I have two numbers written in scientific notation, and you can see they both share the times 10 to the power of something in common. The exponent can be positive or negative. It doesn't make a difference, but it has to be times 10 to the power of something. Now, looking at the number in front of the times 10, both numbers have to be single digits between one to 10. That means you can't have something like 25 times 10 to the power of three, because that's a two digit number. And you can't have something like 0 0.25 times 10 to the power of five, because that's not between one and 10. It can't start with a zero. Now, the second thing to keep in mind for the number in front of the times 10 is that it should be at least two sig figs at a minimum. However, having said that, some teachers don't really mind you doing one sig fig, like nine times 10 to the prime negative four, but it's usually frowned upon. It's gonna depend on your teacher's preferences, but as a good habit, always try to keep the number in the front, a minimum of two sig figs. Let's take a look at this number in scientific notation and see if we can write it as the actual number itself. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, why bother doing that when I can just use a calculator and crunch it in, it will just give me the number. I agree, I completely agree, and you're right. However, I think it's better for you to know how to do it at least manually by hand, because then it'll be helpful for you to go backwards from an actual number and writing it as scientific notation. 
So first what we do is we're going to copy down a number in the front. That number is going to be the basis of how we change it into the actual number. Now the next is we're going to look at the exponent. The exponent is the instructions on how to move the decimal. If the exponent is positive, like this case, we move the decimal to the right. How many times? However many times the exponent is. So in this case, our exponent is 4. So we're going to move that decimal once, twice, three times, and four times to the right. And there it is. That is a decimal. And those empty slots you see, we're going to fill them in with zeros, giving us a number of 25,000. Let's take a look at this one here. Exact same thing. We're going to write down our number in the front, 2.5. This time our exponent is negative, meaning we're going to move the decimal to the left three times. So let's do it. One, two, three. There is a decimal. Fill in the two slots with zeros. And of course, put a zero in front of the decimal for good habit. So our final answer is 0 0.0025. All right, let's now take a number and transform it into scientific notation. First things first, our first number can only be a single digit number between 1 to 9. So looking at this number of 3,008,500, we have no choice but to put the decimal right after the 3 to keep it a 3 point something something number. At least it's between 1 to 9. Okay. So we do that and we have 3.0085 times 10 to the power of something. We don't know. Now you might be wondering what happened to those two zeros after the five? Why didn't I put it there in my scientific notation? Well, let's look at like a sig figs here. This number has five sig figs. Look at my scientific notation. I kept it as five. Do I have to do that? Absolutely not. I could have written it as the original number just with a decimal after the three. That would actually give it seven sig figs because the two zeros now after the five they're now redundant, whereas they weren't earlier. I could have also kept it as one zero if I wanted, or I could keep it as however many zeros as I wanted after five because they're redundant. They don't affect the question, but they affect my sig figs. So as you can see, scientific notation is a great way to manipulate the number of sig figs you have in your final answer to make sure you have the right sig figs. Okay, back to this question here. I still have no idea what to put for my exponents here. All I know right now is this. I'm going to give this number to someone, 3.0085 times 10 to the power of something, and they're supposed to know that it's 3,008,500. How? What instructions must I leave that person so they can come to the right number? Well, it all comes down to the location of the decimals. The proper place for the decimal in my 3,008,500 should be after the last zero in 500, right? But because I'm writing it in scientific notation, I forcefully put it right after the three. So I have to leave instructions in my exponent slot to tell the person which way to move that decimal right behind the three. So it ends up in the proper spot, which is after the last zero in 500. So how do I go from a yellow decimal, which is the one I put there as my scientific notation, to the red decimal, which is where it should be the whole time? I have to move it. One, two, three, four, five, six times to the right. So my exponent will be power of positive six. All right, let's take a look at this number now. First off, how many sig figs does it have? One sig fig, very nice. Okay, so then if you want to write this as scientific notation, you might want to do this, right? One sig fig, one sig fig. But remember, we're not allowed to keep our first number in the scientific notation as one sig fig for the most part. So it's much better to put it as 8.0 times 10 to the power of something. Now, you might be wondering, how did you get 8.0? Well, I just manually put the decimal after the 8 because I had to make sure that the first number in scientific notation has to be a one-digit number between 1 and 9. The only digit in 0 0.0008 that is between 1 and 9 is the 8. So I have to manually put the decimal right after the 8 to give it 8.0. Now. How is someone going to look at 8.0 times 10 to the power of something going to know that the real number I'm trying to talk about is 0 0.0008? The real location of the decimal is there, isn't it? Between the first zero and the second zero. But I manually put the decimal after the 8 so that my number can be a one digit number between 1 and 9. So that means I have to move my decimal 1, 2, 3, 4 times to the left so that it can become the original number. So I have to leave that in the exponent as my instructions. So the answer here in scientific notation should be 8.0 times 10 to the power of negative four. And when you see the negative four, then you know, ah, I'm gonna move that decimal that I see in the 8.0. I'm gonna move it four times to the left and you'll end up with 0 0.0008.
Okay, let's see what happens when we multiply different numbers with scientific notations. In this case, when you multiply these in your calculator, you'll get something like 989.8. Well, how would you leave this in your answer? Look at the numbers here. How many sig figs do my two numbers have? Three and two. That means you must keep your final answer as two sig figs. So we need to round this to either 990, or you can write this number first as a scientific notation, which is 9.898 times 10 to the power of two, and then round it to two sig figs, which will become 9.9 .9 times 10 to the power of two. When you're adding numbers in scientific notation, especially with different exponents, there isn't much you can do in terms of shortcuts. You just have to figure out what each of these numbers are, add them up, you can leave your answer like this, or you can convert it into a scientific notation. When you're adding or subtracting scientific notation numbers with the same exponent, you can actually just add or subtract the two numbers in the front and then have it all times the 10 to the power of whatever they share in common. Just remember, now that you're adding with decimals, you have to respect the rule of keeping the lowest decimal. Here, 9.8 only has one decimal spot, that's the lowest, so when you add it, you have to keep it as 10.8 times 10 to the power of three, but we have a problem, don't we? Yeah, we can have a number in the front of our scientific notation greater than nine. This is 10, it's a two digit number, that's no good. Which means we have to move the decimal once to the left here. But by doing that, we're 10 times smaller. So to compensate for that, we can make our times 10 to the power of three, 10 times bigger, and it becomes 10 to the power of four. Balanced out. Okay, some of you are probably thinking, scientific notation is cool and all, but why do I have to use it? Well, the obvious answer would be because some numbers just have a lot of zeros. They might be very, very small or very, very large. But yeah, let's say you're just gonna bite the bullet and just write down all those zeros. You prefer to write down the entirety of a number. Do you really need scientific notation then? The answer is yes, you still do because of sig figs. And here you'll see why. Well, first start with this example. In this one here, you actually don't really need scientific notation, but it helps. So 305 times 16 is gonna give us 4,880. But based on the sig fig rules here, we have to keep a minimum of two sig figs. So we can either round this to 4,900, or you can write it as a scientific notation, 4.880 times 10 to the power of three, and then round it to sig figs, which is 4.9 times 10 to the power of three. In this case, I find rounding decimal numbers to be a lot easier and more intuitive than rounding 4,880 to 4,900 because we don't do it as much in math. But that one we could have gotten away with writing the number, fine. But what about this one? In this case, we have 415 times 12, which is 4,980. Okay, but as per the sig fig rules, we can only keep two sig figs because of the 12, so we have to somehow round this 4,980 to two sig figs. We can only round up, but when you round up, what happens, it becomes 5,000. Uh-oh, that's only one sig fig. So we're screwed. So then what do we do? Well, you can take the 5,000, write it as a scientific notation, which is 5.000 times 10 to the power of three. And then you can see, ah, I'll just chop off two zeros and make it 5.0, two sig figs times 10 to the power of three. But you could have also just looked at the 4,980 and said, you know what? I'm just gonna go straight to scientific notation because rounding is easier in decimals write that as a scientific notation, and now you can see 4.9, I'm gonna round that up to 5.0 times 10 to the power of three. Lastly, let's take a look at this one here. When you multiply these two numbers, you're gonna get 2,000, and that is already a problem. There is no way you can take 2,000 and round it or do anything to make two sig figs out of it. It's one sig fig. So what do we do? We have no choice but to use scientific notation to help us manipulate sig figs. We rewrite this as a scientific notation, and then we can chop off zeros, however many we want, or you can even add zeros if you want more sig figs, and we get this here as two sig figs in our answer. So as you can see, scientific notation is extremely useful when you wanna manipulate the number of sig figs you want in your final answer. And that wraps up our video on sig figs and scientific notation. Now that you know how they work, it all comes down to practice and being careful on the tests to not make any silly mistakes. If you liked the video, remember to give the video a like. And if you really liked the video, feel free to subscribe, help out the channel, I appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments, or topic requests, remember you can always write it down in the comment section down below.